Um, I'm going to talk about emotion and decision making. I want to start with kind of what we think uh, generally uh, about emotion and decision making. So <clears throat> the, the sort of classical view of emotion and decision making, starting with uh, philosophers such as Plato, you know, Freud, um, you know, many, many other philosophers you can think about um, you know, throughout history, more recently uh, economic theory, has this idea that we really have these competing processes. Uh, our choices are either driven by reason or emotion, as if you know, we have two output systems in the brain. Uh, and often, when we talk about that, we talk about choices driven by emotion as being less rational or irrational. Um, what I'm going to argue today <clears throat> is this approach doesn't really fit with what we know from uh, affective science in the brain or affective science more broadly. So what I'm going to argue is instead of thinking about the relationship between emotion and decision making as sort of two opposing forces, uh, we have to think about emotion as um, having a modulatory role in cognition. <clears throat> and we can start thinking about this because we know from lots of work in brain science that not really, there's not really an emotion system in the brain or a cognitive system. There are a range of what we call cognitive systems. Um, the, the classic description of an emotion system in the brain is the limbic system. People who do affective neuroscience uh, you know, have argued for a long time that this is really an outdated concept that needs to be abandoned. Um, that there's really not one system in the brain that drives emotion. Um, there's no inclusion, exclusion criteria for what's limbic or what's not. The definition of limbic has changed over the years. Uh, and Joe Ledoux, who I collaborate with a lot, uh, has argued forcefully that by maintaining this idea of a limbic system or an emotion system in the brain, we're actually impeding scientific discovery because it's really just a characterization of a bunch of brain areas that do slightly different things. Um, and I would agree with Joe 100%. Um, and so we don't think of brain systems of emotion and reason. Um, and if we look at other types of cognitive functions, if we look at attention, memory, perception, what we normally talk about is not <clears throat> excuse me, emotion driving the memory. right? We talk about the modulatory role between emotion and cognition. So here's just a, a, a slide. I took this is actually a monkey brain, which is why it looks squished. Um, a cartoon version of the uh, connectivity between a brain region we often implicate in emotion. It's certainly not the only brain region we implicate in emotion, but it will be the one I talk about most today. Um, the amygdala and the visual cortex. And when we, what we know is that the amygdala has strong connectivities with all different uh, stages of, of visual cortical, cortical processing. The amygdala gets information about the threat value of a stimulus very early on and then can modulate further perceptual processing. A similar circuitry could be drawn for something like emotions modulation of memory, uh, for instance. Um, but for all these other cognitive functions other than decision making, we think about emotions having this modulatory role. And I'm going to argue that this modulatory framework should also be adopted for decision making. Um, I'm gonna, and so I also just want to point out there's sort of two ways we think of emotions modulating decision making. Um, and I point here, I actually wrote an annual review chapter um, this year or t last year for neuroscience, annual review in neuroscience. Jen Lerner, who's a researcher at Harvard, um, wrote one for annual review of psychology uh, in 2015. We both broke down the, dis the space of emotion decision making into two general um, classes of an influence for emotional decisions. The first one, I'm not going to talk about this today, is what we both called incidental affect. And this is the carryover effects of emotion. So here, if you're in an emotional state, let's say you're stressed, you're in a bad mood, you know, a sad mood or an angry mood, and you encounter a decision you have to make, it will alter the decision process, right? So the mood is, is, is not part of the decision process, not driven by the decision process. Uh, the state is not driven by the decision process. But if you're in that state and you encounter a decision, it creates a change in your brain that then changes uh, the way you evaluate the decision. Um, and we actually both use the same term to describe this. The other uh, means by which emotion can influence decisions, uh, I called emotion as value. Jen called integral emotions. I kind of like her term better to be honest. Um, I might adopt it in the future. Um, and this is saying that the 
affective response you have to the choice options or the choice outcomes um, is a component of the value computation. So clearly, you know, when we talk about decisions in the laboratory, we also talk about monetary decisions. Clearly, you know, the monetary amount is a big part of the value computation. But other aspects, um, you know, can be other, you know, other aspects, or even the monetary amount can elicit emotional responses, emotional reactions that then get incorporated into the value computation. So I'm going to talk today about a line of research or two lines of research uh, looking at emotion as value. Um, and one is going to be take about two thirds of the talk, maybe a little bit more. The other one will be much briefer. Um, let me just outline what those are for you. Oh, so, and so, so I just wonder, how do we approach this question? So when we want to understand emotion decision making first, we want to be able to take advantage of the tools of economics, neuroeconomics, looking at decision making. We have computational models of value and learning. We also want to take advantage of the psychological theories of affect and its control or regulation. Um, and we want to be able to measure and manipulate these affective components to see how they change the decisions that we make. Um, and so the first line of research we looked at was to identify very specific links between unique components of affect and specific decision processes. So let me give you an example of what I mean. So I mean, when I say affect or emotion influences decision making, I'm using two very general terms to describe uh, things that are actually not general at all, right? So there's many things we call affect or emotion, and there are many uh, factors that contribute to decision making. Just to give you a few examples, we have physiological arousal that can be elicited by emotional event or by, by events. We, can, <clears throat> we have subjective feelings about them. We have the expression of them. Um, you know, we also can talk about things like stress and mood. In decision making, you know, we can, we can pull apart different factors that contribute to the decision process, such as how averse to losses are you? How, how much do you like risk? You know, we can look at temporal discounting as Joe does. You know, how do we make choices over time? Uh, how do you weigh probabilities? How consistent are you? Um, and one of the jobs of neuroeconomists these days is to pull apart these different factors and characterize them individually. Um, and what, what I would argue is you know, to really have a sophisticated understanding about the relationship between emotion and decision making, we have to start linking specific components of affect with specific components of decision making um, and identify those links. And then the next stage, I would say, you know, one of the things we know about emotion, excuse me, is that we can change emotion. We have a range of techniques we can use to change emotion. If emotion is contributing to decision making in very specific ways, we should be able to then change those emotional reactions and change the choices. So this is the, the um, you'll see this sort of fear, this sort of uh, approach in the first series I, I talk about in some detail. The next series is a little bit more just giving you some examples of the kinds of things we do. So one thing I'm going to talk about today, so I think there's a lot of circuitries involved in, the, in understanding the relationship between emotion and decision making, but I'm going to highlight one um, because uh, you know, it's a circuitry that's not just involved in emotion and decision making, it's involved in uh, having threat values influence actions. So this is a slide I took from a review by Joe Ledoux and Jack Gorman. Uh, and what they were doing was uh, trying to characterize how we act, the neurosurgery involved in acting in the face of threat, what they called active coping. Uh, and they identified this circuitry where we have the amygdala. And the amygdala, you've probably heard a lot about the amygdala. Um, but the amygdala we know is important in, uh, in detections of threat in the environment learning that certain stimuli predict aversive consequences, among other things. I want to make it really clear. You know, the amygdala has a lot of components that do a lot of different things, among other things. When you encounter a threat that you know, leads to a bodily physiological response, a fight or flight response, that physiological response requires the, um, the, 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 path, the, the information go through the central nucleus of the amygdala, which goes to the brainstem, that results in these sort of arousal stress responses. However, when 
you, uh, you detect a threat, which often happens, you know, which often involves lateral nucleus, and you act. Now you take an action to avoid the threat. That requires a pathway for the basal nucleus that goes to the striatum. The striatum is a region that we know is involved uh, in, in action values, subjective value. So this pathway, so if you actually damaged this pathway, you would still act in the face of threat. You just wouldn't show me the physiological response. If you damaged this pathway, you would not act to avoid the threat, but you would uh, show me the physiological response. Okay. So this is a, so I'm going to just highlight this amygdala striatal circuitry as one circuitry we think may play a role when emotion influences decisions. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, no, I think, you know, obviously the fight or flight response has a lot of important functions. And th the thing to remember is these two are actually going, are acting together at almost all times. So we know part of the fight or flight response. Oh, so that's what I think. Yeah, so that, you know, so it's not like these are not normally dissociated, right. even though they're independent pathways. But, you know, the whole, uh, the whole autonomic nervous system is designed to be able to get your respiration up and things like that so you can promote action, right? Just because they're generated through different pathways doesn't mean they operate independently. Right. Yeah. You could argue, you know, that you don't need all these stress responses. Some would argue that, but um, I think that probably wouldn't be very adaptive either. So, all right. So I'm just going to highlight this circuitry a few times throughout the talk. Um, and I'm going to focus on two lines of research. Most of the time I'll be talking about this because I feel like in this line of research we've gone to some lengths to really investigate uh, this question of how can I link specific components of affect to specific uh, components of decision making and then how do I manipulate the affect to change the choice. And then I'm going to give you a, a little snippet of research looking at the role of affect in social decision making. So you know, one of the things that's most uh, likely to generate some sort of affect response for us is other people. Uh, so what does just the presence of other people, how does that change our decisions? And particularly, how does our affective uh, response to those individuals change our decisions? Um, but I'll spend most of the time talking about this part of the talk. All right, so risky decisions. Let's start with risky decisions. Imagine you're this guy, and I say to you, um, you have a choice, so you have this gamble 50-50. If you take the gamble 50-50, you'll win 14 or lose 11. You don't take the gamble, you just get nothing. Who's taking the gamble? Okay, well, you know, you not very loss averse people, right? So many people didn't take the gamble, right? And one of the reasons you didn't take the gamble is because people tend to overvalue. I mean, you you know, technically you should win money. You know, if, if you you know, if you do this a hundred times, you're going to walk away with money, right? But granted, you only have one time. Um, but, but some people think, you know, losing this is more, they weigh this stronger than winning this. That's loss aversion. Um, so, so you take the gamble, the guy says, no thanks. I do some manipulation, let's say, and now the person says yes. The question is, what did I change when, you know, this person changes their mind? So again, it could be that I've changed how they differentially value losses versus gain or loss aversion. It could be that, you know, this person generally doesn't like t chance, but now they like it a little bit more just taking chance, and we call that risk. So what are their risk attitudes? Could be that this person's just not very consistent over time, right? They just change their, you know, in decision-making tasks, just change the things that they do. Um, and so in many tasks, like this one, these th three things are confounded. And what we're going to try to do is, is unconfound them and see how they link to specific, a specific affect variable. Um, so this is a study, so you know, this notion that emotion is part of your value computation, um, you know, is something that this study, which was 1997, one of the very first studies looking at emotion decision making, highlighted, right? And this, do you guys know this task? The Iowa gambling task? Anybody not know this task? Okay, you guys are going to have to let me know. Um, so I'm hoping you know this. But the, the idea here is that your arousal response drives you eventually through a number of trials to picking the good decks, that's actually more adaptive for you to pick the good decks. Um, in the original version of this task, Bakara and all suggested that this is arousal is actually linked to your perception of risk. 
right? Um, I'm going to come to a different conclusion by using a different task and getting the same question. Because in this task, it could be that the arousal response is related to your aversion of loss. It could be that the arousal is a learning signal that you're using to perform this task. You're getting better over time. It could be that in here you have a lot of ambiguity about what's going on, right? So it could just be that you, know, it's a, you, you don't like ambiguity and arousal is coding for that. Um, so this is a great start in linking emotion to decision making, but I'm going to argue that it was, you know, it's, it's not a very refined way to, to, to look at the problem. Uh, and to get at this, we're going to do a different task that's going to allow us to differentiate some of these. So this, this is not ambiguous, meaning there's no unknown probabilities, which there was in the Iowa gambling task. Um, but we do a task like this, so something like you just saw, 50-50 chance of winning or losing, or you can just not do anything, it's guaranteed. Have about 120 trials of this. In addition, now one of the problems with this is I wouldn't be able to pull out whether you just don't like risk or if you don't like loss, right? which you weigh more strongly. I can also add these trials where I only have gains. Here I'm getting at risk, uninfluenced by how much you really don't like loss. Okay, um, and so, this is just, yeah. We tell them, They're, and they practice it. Okay. Yeah, and it's, I think it's on there. It says 0. 0.5 and 0. 0.5. I'll show you what it looks like in a second. I mean, we just tell them, you know, this half 50-50 chance you'll get this or this. Yeah. 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 So, so in this one, so both, so this, this particular type of thing is measuring both risk and loss, right? Uh, loss aversion. There's no loss aversion, I'm sorry, this one, right? There's no loss aversion if there's no potential for loss, right? So, so that's sort of, so by, by, by having this well-designed series of gambles, we can pull out, you know, the influence of risk. Uh, and I'll show you this in a second. So these, this is rho is your risk coefficient. This is lambda that's your loss aversion coefficient. Yeah. I guess to ask the question, yeah. like, why, why do you not think that they're just sort of banking that $9 and then thinking the gamble is negative 7 plus or, or plus 7 or negative 9? So why aren't they reinterpreting it as loss? Um, I, well, I will say so that we, well, be, well, one thing I'll say is they don't actually correlate with the same things. Right, so they're, they're uncorrelated in different individuals. And so, and, and I'll show you an example in terms of them, uh, uh, at least in this case, arousal not correlating with both of them, but one instead. So with these models, we can pull out these different variables. So loss aversion, um, we use the term lam lambda. Um, if it's above one, you're loss averse. If it's at less than one, you're what we call gain seeking. Uh, risk attitudes, we use the term rho. You're, um, Below, below uh, one, you're, called, you're risk averse. If you're above one, you're risk seeking. And consistency, we measure uh, with mu. And again, we can be no more noisy across the trial. So how often do you change your preference across trials uh, or more consistent? Um, and so again, in the loss aversion, we only, we only have gambles that have gains and losses. But here, we have gain-only trials as well, which help us pull out uh, risk attitudes irrespective of losses. And here we look at consistency by giving a, a range of trials and measuring over time. All right. So uh, the affective response we're going to measure, like Bacar et al., is arousal, physiological arousal. It's an easy thing to measure because it doesn't ask, require you to ask individuals every trial what they think. Um, so you know it's, it's passive. You can just hook them up, and they can do the task. Uh, it's a slightly lagged response to the actual stimulus you see. So it looks something like this. Here's the event. Here's the response to that event. So they did one whole set like this. It's actually 150 choices. Sorry, it's not 140. Um, again, this is what they saw something like this, 50-50, or guaranteed. They practiced it ahead of time, so they knew what to do. Um, did they accept or not? So here are individual subjects, right? Here, these people in red are, are statistically loss averse. This person has a greater noise, so it's not. These people in blue uh, are gain-loss neutral. These people in green are actually gain-seeking and loss-averse. Um, I'm not presenting, uh, I'm not going to present risk 
and uh, can listen to here because I'll tell you they had absolutely zero relationship to all the uh, affective variables that we've looked at. Um, so just to look at arousal, we measured arousal during this task. What we did find was arousal tracks loss aversion. So this is, uh, this is uh, the, what we call sweat per buck, sweat per dollar, um, to the outcome of when you, when you uh, to the outcome that you get, uh, losses minus gain. And the more you are aroused by losses relative to gains, the more loss averse you are. No relationship between risk sensitivity and arousal, no relationship between consistency and arousal. Um, we know, you know, so this suggests to us that the physiological response you have to losses relative to gains is related to, you know, how you weight losses and gains in decision making. One factor that can mediate this is actually whether or not you're aware of your physiological response. So does it help to be aware of your physiological response? People vary in this, this idea that you actually kind of know what's going on with your body. We call it interoception. Um, and so we looked at interoception. So interoception is a perception of one's own internal bodily state. We know that people that have good interoception, and people vary a lot on this, claim they have more subjective intense experiences, um, have greater sort of craving and addiction. Uh, and in, uh, in games like the ultimatum game, they have higher rejection rates of unfair offers. Um, the way you measure it is you do something like this. You are presenting tones that either are in sync with the heartbeat, which you're also measuring, or out of sync with the heartbeat that you're also measuring. You ask people to indicate when they think the tone is in sync, and you measure a uh, measure of sensitivity or D-prime. What we found is that people who have good interoception are also more loss averse, right? So individuals who not just do you show higher arousal to losses relative to gains, but if you're actually better at picking up your internal arousal signals, you also show more loss aversion. And again, no relationship with risk attitudes or consistency. Um, in looking at the brain, we wanted to then say, well, we think we know a model for avoidance actions, which we think loss aversion is in some ways an economic avoidance action. You're avoiding something you find a threat, which is a, essentially a loss. Um, so we, there's one previous study that looked at loss aversion in the brain uh, done by from Russ Poldrack's lab published in Science. He found that stradial activity at the time of decision is correlated. He said it was loss aversion, but really it was subjective value. So he used a task much like the one that uh, I showed you earlier, where there was both a gamble task where it didn't separate loss aversion and risk sensitivity. When we used our task and we looked at the time of decision and we correlated uh, subjective value with, uh, with the brain activity, we also found striatum. So even though you know, this, is, this was termed loss aversion, what we really think it is is subjective value. Subjective value, you know, how you value any decision, incorporates both your loss aversion and your risk attitudes. When we looked for brain regions that correlate primarily with loss aversion, the one that emerged was the amygdala. So we do whole brain correlation with loss aversion across individuals. Uh, and what we find is left amygdala activation. And this is during the outcome phase. Um, and here I'm just showing you that correlation. Um, so this you know, suggests to us a model, right, where striatum uh, tracks bold, uh, the striatum bold tracks subjective value, the amygdala bold tracks loss aversion. Um, and we think it's somewhat consistent with this model that the amygdala is providing a signal, uh, perhaps a, a unique signal about loss that then gets incorporated into the calculated subject of subjective value, which we know uh, the striatum is a region that integrates those signals um, and then helps lead to uh, a motivated action. All right, so, so far I've suggested to you that the anticipated affective response to a choice is incorporated into the value computation and modulates risky decisions and, and specifically loss aversion. Um, I now want to move on to this, this next part. Can we then change emotion, change arousal, and then change the decision? And specifically, will it be specific to something like loss aversion versus risk attitudes? Yeah. Um, 
So, usually, so in this particular experiment, we didn't do both because when we actually did the skin conductance response, we had to slow it down quite a bit to get the whole measurement. Um, whereas with the bolts, we could, we could deconvolve it, you know. So we, and so we didn't actually do it because it was, would be quite long in the scanner. I mean, it's often the case if you use, I mean, it's not always the case that you see arousal, physiological arousal, tr you know, tracking amygdala, but sometimes you do. So I don't know if we would have seen it in this case. Um, but simply because it's, the arousal study just took a lot longer. We didn't want to do that in the scanner. All right, so, so the heart, you know, so now I'm suggesting to you there's this correlation, right, between loss aversion uh, specifically and arousal, not risk sensitivity, not consistency. So then if I change emotion, and particularly arousal, sh I should be able to change loss aversion. Uh, so we did this with two approaches. And the first is a, sort of a cognitive emotion regulation manipulation. So here's just an example. I took this from a, from a, a sort of example of a CBT treatment thing where they show you pictures like this and they say, you know, we often underestimate how much how we think about things can determine our emotional responses. So here's a cat who sees a dog, same dog. One thing, sees a playmate, one sees a threat. Um, I'm just going to give you a little, this is sort of moving back to my other line of research, um, about the circuitry we would expect to see in emotion regulation. And for, to look at the circuitry, just to identify the circuitry to start, I'm going to talk a little bit about study we did in fear conditioning. Um, and so here, we did a study where we showed a blue square what, that predicted you'd get a shot, a yellow square that predicted you would not. They, before they saw the blue and yellow square, we gave them a cue that said attend or regulate. Attend meant if you saw attend, focus on your natural feelings when you see this stimulus that predicts you might get a shock. When you see regulate, use the color of the cue to think of something calming in nature. Right? Um, so in other words, reinterpret the significance of that stimulus. When we do this, we see a circuitry, I'm not going to show you all the data, where we know the amygdala is involved in the simple type of learning and that sort of physiological expression of the emotional response. The ventral medial prefrontal cortex has strong connectivity with the amygdala, uh, it can inhibit the amygdala response. Dorsolateral prefrontal cortex does not have strong connectivity with the amygdala, but it does with more uh, ventral and lateral uh, medial regions of the prefrontal cortex, so we uh, hypothesize it has its effect, and we actually could show through a connectivity analysis that the dorsal prefrontal cortex inhibits amygdala via the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. Um, we did a similar study looking at here um, using money. So now a tender regulate. This means you're going to win money. This means you're going to, uh, I'm sorry, this means you're not going to win money. This means you will. Again, so here I didn't show you the physiology for the last one. It looked much like this. This effect was even stronger than with the fear stuff. But, you know, here you're attending, you're aroused, you think you're getting money, you're regulating, you don't, you diminish that arousal. Um, stridal bold responses also go down. Um, and we see this increase in the left middle frontal gyrus consistent with this dorsolateral prefrontal cortex region. So again, just a similar circuitry. DLPFC, I didn't present the VMPFC, but was also involved in that study, um, here modulating stridum. So we think, you know, this reappraisal alters an emotional response through a circuitry engaging the DLPFC, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, and the stridum. Um, and so we wanted to investigate if that circuitry uh, will be engaged in our decision-making task, and if using a reappraisal strategy will actually diminish the arousal, resp the arousal response and emotion uh, in, or, excuse me, and loss aversion in this task. So they did the exact same series of gambles, but there were two sets. The first set, they were, uh, they were given the cue attend. They were told, when you see the word attend, I want you to make each choice as if it's, you're only thinking about this choice in isolation, just this choice. When you see the word regulate, I want you to think about, sort of think like a trader. Imagine through all these choices, there's multiple choices, you'll get paid for some subset of them, like you're, com you're, you're coming with a portfolio of choices. So this is one of many choices that you make. And under each of these, these uh, we, did this, we did this block, 10 choices each. Under each of these, we can measure loss aversion, uh, risk sensitivity, and consistency of our choices. Um, so here are the, the data I showed you earlier. Uh, these are the highly loss averse subjects. These are the gain-seeking subjects. 
Here is the decrease, the percent decrease in loss aversion uh, during the regulation, you know, regulate versus attend. Okay, so you can see almost all individuals, uh, whether they were highly loss averse or not, showed less loss aversion when they used the regulate strategy. Uh, and this was highly significant uh, across the group. Uh, when we looked to see what the difference in the skin conductance response was, here I looked at the uh, loss versus gain skin conductance overall during attend and during regulate. Now we could go back to these individuals and say which ones showed stronger responses, really significant individually, which ones were not. And we broke those people down, oh, I didn't show you, uh, to regulators and non-regulators. This, this effect was driv driven by people that really showed a strong change in loss aversion. Uh, when we looked in the brain, when we try look for regions which show greater responses to losses when you're attending versus regulate, we see the amygdala. And also this change in loss aversion correlated with the change in amygdala bold signal to losses, uh, but not gains. And finally, we saw these baseline shifts. This was done in blocks in these other regions that we expected to be part of the circuitry. The dorsolateral prefrontal cortex higher when you're regulating. Same thing with the striatum and the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. Consistent with what we think is this circuitry of regulation of decisions, which is really just the circuitry of regulating emotions in this case, right? Where the DLPFC plays a role in the sort of cognitive regulation, the sort of man online manipulation of your reinterpretation of the, uh, of the meaning. The ventral medial prefrontal cortex plays, has an inhibitory link with both the striatum uh, and the amygdala, uh, which then changes responses in those regions. All right. Um, so I'm just going to give you this one. This is, I, I always find a cool study. So here's a, you know, what does these mean outside the laboratory? Well, one person who's very interested in our work is this guy named Andrew Lowe. Uh, and Andrew Lowe has done some really cool studies with traders where he actually hooks them up with a whole bunch of physiological equipment and looks at the relationship between physiological arousal and trading. And he finds that people that have show higher variability in their physiological arousal to choices actually more, are less good traders, right? Uh, he actually argues that this is because they're born this way. So maybe, you know, when you have market events and you're really aroused by it, maybe it's the case that you were born that way. We actually think maybe it's because you've got an experience, you're good at you know, realizing this is just part of the market, Right? You're reinterpreting this you know, as one of many, a bigger thing. So you can learn to regulate. And the people that learn to regulate, their arousal responses are less likely to act you know, sort of rash, you know, I should say. I don't want to use the word rational. It's not irrational. But less, less, less likely to respond to these sudden losses in ways that may not be you know, great for future, uh, uh, future profits. Um, and that's why they are experienced high performing traders. Um, so it's, you know, a debate as to why. Another thing that Andrew's interested in in our lab is this notion that pharmacology can change emotion and therefore can change the choices you make. And particularly, pharmacology, we know, can change arousal, right? We use this for things like high blood pressure all the time, right? High blood pressure, um, you know, is part of that is the fact that you're, you know, sort of this consistent stress response for help that's pushing up your blood pressure. So we can control that. We can control your blood pressure. Does it also change your choices? Um, and so just to go back to this sort of circuitry, we talked about this circuitry here, the amygdala uh, media, uh, communicating with the striatum the, when there's some sort of threat that helps facilitate decisions. Um, we think here we've seen evidence for the amygdala. Also, this signal getting incorporated to the calculated subjective value in the striatum. That then leads to sort of an avoidance decision. Uh, and what we know about this circuitry, at least for memory systems, including the striatum and the hippocampus, and this is work by Jim McGall, is that the influence of the amygdala on these systems is adrenergically mediated by noradrenaline, right? So you can actually give a drug that blocks noradrenaline, and then you can find that you don't show, at least in terms of memory, the influence of the amygdala or arousal on memory performance. So the question we want to ask is, can we give that drug in decision making and also block um, the influence of arousal in decision making. And the drug we're giving is, is called, uh, so can we reduce loss aversion by pharmacologically reducing arousal? 
<clears throat> and the, blood we're, the, the drug we're giving is called propranolol. It's a non-selective beta adrenergic receptor antagonist. It's the same drug that's been used by McGaw and others to show how you can modulate uh, the arousal effects on memory. Um, and I want to say, point out that people don't often talk about this. It's highly lipophilic. What that means is if you got more fat, it's going to work less well on you, right? <clears throat> it passes, because it's lipophilic, it passes the blood-brain barrier. Not all these drugs do, right? So one control study we want to do is a drug that doesn't pass the, pass the blood-brain barrier. We just, these are difficult studies to do, so we haven't done that yet. Um, but uh, so it crosses the blood-brain barrier to act centrally and peripherally. Um, and because it's lipophilic, it has what we call a dose-dependent pharmacokinetics. Individuals with high body mass experience lower peak concentrations. Lots of studies in humans don't take this into consideration, but all studies in rodents do. Um, so it blunts arousal responses. It doesn't have sedative effects, uh, and it has stronger effects in smaller individuals. We, I should say, when we did this study, we asked people afterwards, did you think you got the drug or not? Everybody got the, got, had both conditions. They were at chance. So you don't actually feel like you have, at the dose we gave, that you actually took a drug. So what do we do? Uh, a two-day parrot protocol, double-blind study. Um, <clears throat> they either got the placebo or propranolol. 30 minutes later, they ate something. Um, 90 minutes later, this is when you get the peak concentration of the drug. They did the decision task. We measured the parameters. Did that again a week later. They got whichever one they didn't. And here they were 47% corrected at guessing which one they got. What we found, so here, I'm just day one and day two is just drug or not drug day. Um, we're looking at the change in loss aversion across, what, you know, when they took, uh, the change in loss aversion when they were on placebo or propranolol. Um, if we do all subjects, we don't see an effect. If we, but here, this is our body mass index. We actually had some people that were quite large, um, you know, some people that were very fit. And we definitely see, a, a, we see a, a significant effect only in our low BMI individuals. And our breakdown in low BMI is basically at, you know, the, the guidelines for overweight based on BMI. Um, so uh, these interact to reduce loss aversion. Uh, and again, no changes in risk or choice consistency in this type of task. So what we found is we're parallel with loss aversion in a dose-dependent manner, depends on your body weight, which, which actually correlates with your dose. No effect on risk attitudes or consistency. This corroborates all the studies showing loss aversion specifically is linked to arousal, amygdala striatal circuitry, uh, and the adrenergic system in particular. Um, and it aligns with studies from other domains looking at amygdala striatal systems as they modulate uh, memory and avoidance actions. Yeah. It does not, no. There was an effective day, so this is actually residual taking out the effective day. So they were, you know, 50% of subjects had propranolol the first day, second day. And, you know, in studies we've done in our lab, we've done multiple day things. We didn't see that effect, but with this group we did. So we just took out the effective day. But in BMI had no uh, effect on those things. And there was, there was, I don't think there was a day effect on risk or consistency, but I can't promise you that. Yeah. So you said you, you uh, you're interested in doing the study on the peripheral testing yeah. data blocker? Yeah. Because if, if I'm trying to remember, I, I think some of McGaw's yeah. effects he showed were peripheral, which would be... Um, that's not my recollection. Did I, did I miss that? Okay. Yeah, that's not but my it, recollection. Okay, but, but I think if there were, um, mm -hmm. you mentioned it as a control, but if they were, it would be consistent with these you know, ideas of arousal not just being a, a marker of something that's happening peripherally, mm -hmm. but actually something that you perceive yep. and read out, and then that affects your decision making, right? Right. I mean, it, so yeah, so it's an interesting question. You know, I actually don't think it'll have an effect because I think those things are related. Um, it, to me, that's a strong test of the somatic marker hypothesis, yeah. Yeah. right? Which I think is wrong, right? Um, <laughs> and, you know, so the somatic marker hypothesis, you know, basically says that arousal arousal is the signal driving you, and that shouldn't matter about the brain part, because, you know, lots of studies that have, have, you know, have shown that individuals who don't show physiological arousal still show these, you know, changes in, you know, the, the learning in the Iowa gambling task, for instance. Um, and then, you know, what Damasio would argue, or Bacara, is that there's this as-if loop, 
right? So you don't actually need the physiologic arousal per se. You kind of have this loop in your brain that does it. So I actually think we won't see it with the peripheral because I think we're targeting a particular mechanism that we know is already linked to modulation between brain circuits mediating these effects. But we haven't done that study because it was so difficult to do just the one study. Pharmacology studies are a pain in the ass. Um, I would love to do that study, but they won't pay me for it. So. And I can't pay for it out of my pocket. But. All right. So, so just, just to wrap up this part of the talk, and then I'm going to get to some of the social decision-making work, um, which I think at this point is still a little less you know, precise, but I think still really interesting in the kinds of things we want to delve into. Um, I've suggested to you that you know, specific affective responses to components of risky decisions influence choices. Specifically, arousal is linked to loss aversion. Um, uh, we're looking at other affective responses we're looking at. We're looking at stress. Interestingly, we find, so stress, again, is more of an incidental affect. We find stress doesn't actually influence risk aversion or, or risk sensitivity or loss aversion. Um, other people have reported other things, but the data is all over the map with that. Um, and then we find that we can, if we change emotion, we change the choice, right? So this is sort of the hard you know, evidence of that one's actually may perhaps causing another. And it's not risk per se, right? It's loss aversion. We're now moving on to ambiguity, which wasn't part of that task. And ambiguity so far, so ambiguity, you don't really know what the odds are. You know it's risky, but you don't really know what the odds are. Um, and in that case, we're finding a profile somewhat similar to loss aversion, where arousal does play a pretty significant role. But that's preliminary data. All right, I want to now move on to social decision making. Um, you know, this is, uh, I think, kind of more interesting. This first one, I actually don't have, um, I don't have uh, good physiological data on. But because it's, uh, we're focusing on something like loss aversion, I think I've shown that there's a link. Uh, and this one is looking at how attitudes about others, and I'm going to argue the evaluative component of attitudes about others, change choices. So these are just sort of demonstrations of other ways we can think about these things in a more social domain. So just the first is just the presence of others. And here I'm going to talk about auctions. Now, auctions are really interesting uh, because uh, one thing we know is a lot of people doing auctions these days are more and more popular. Anybody ever done this? Anybody not done this? No. So you guys should try it, see what you do. Um, I, think, I think eBay's gone down a little bit in popularity, like in the last 10 years. I don't know, has it? I don't know. Anyway, so you can buy things on auctions. This is like, you know, memorable tickets for things. I don't, people sell anything on eBay, anything. You know, Hello Kitty stuff. This, Mauricio Delgado did this study when he was in my lab. He found this on eBay. It is a portable headset <laughs> that you can purchase on eBay, right? So, so one of the reasons why auctions are so interesting, right, is just the, the, the notion of being in an auction will make you pay too much. Economists know this. You overpay in auctions, right? Um, and just to give you a really clear example, this is, if you go to eBay, they have things called eBay gift cards, which I never really knew about. So here's an eBay gift card for $50, and people are bidding $51. Like, if you do this today, you will find this, right? And so the notion is, you know, why would anybody do this? Well, if you've ever been in an auction, you know, you just kind of get, like, you kind of get wrapped up in it. You really want to win, you know? And then, you know, part of the problem with eBay is, like, you just check in back the whole time. You're wasting all your time, basically. Um, so auctions lead to overbidding. We know this. Uh, one of the main theories of, that economists had about why this happens is that we, you, you, when, you, when you win something in an auction, you don't only get the value of the thing that you bid on. You also win, right? And winning in and of itself has a value. So you know, you're paying too much because you're sort of adding the value of winning on top of the value of the thing that you, that you, that you got. Um, so we actually did this study initially to test this idea based on the premise that we know the reward circuitry in the brain is a circuitry that responds to all different kinds of rewards. It responds to monetary rewards. It responds to social rewards. Uh, so that was sort of, you know, we thought maybe this is something we could actually test. Um, so this is the way this study worked. This is Andy Kaplan. He's an economist at NYU. He was my collaborator for this project, uh, along with Mauricio. Um, and they had two different uh, competitions. One was an auction, one was a, a lottery. So here you're playing against another individual. Here you're just, it's, it's a gamble you're taking with a computer, right? So there's no person involved. The incentive was either money or points. We actually got similar results whether it was money or points. I'm just going to combine across those two. 
All right, but this is the main thing. So are you playing against another individual? Is it an auction? Is it a lottery? They were structured exactly the same. Um, so what we found, we looked in, the, in this triatum. So here's the lottery. So remember, so here you win, here you lose. I use the word lose here, right? But you didn't lose anything. You just didn't win, right? You just left as you came, right? So the, what we know about the striatum and the bold signal is if you win money, responses go up. If you lose money, responses go down, right? If nothing happens, it sort of stays flat. That, so here you win money, nothing happens, stays flat. What was interesting is we, you know, our hypothesis initially was maybe we're going to see a boost when you win the auction. Not what we found. What we found is it looked like you lost money when really you lost nothing. But what did you lose? You lost the competition, right? So in other words, you know, we asked the question, you know, so this social competition leads to greater response to losses in the auctions, not gains. Um, we then said, well, is the loss signal or the gain signal are either correlated with what you decided to bid. And we found that the loss signal was correlated with what you decided to bid, but the gain signal was not. So you're choosing to bid, right, basically to avoid the loss, it seems. Um, of course, we can't prove that. There's this correlation uh, between loss signal and in the bid, uh, but no correlation gain signal. But we can't prove that one's causing the other. We have this reverse inference thing, right? We don't, a striatal response is not loss, right? It is a striatal response. Um, and we can't infer this behavior from the brain signal. So we did a separate study um, where we had individuals play 30 rounds of an auction game under three conditions. The first group came in. They were, they were, it was a big economic lab. So they're playing with somebody else in the room uh, every round. Uh, they just came in. They were told the structure of the game. And they played with an indivi a different individual each round. Second group came in. They said, we're going to give you $15 to start. But if you don't win the auction, if you, you, know, if you lose the auction, you, uh, you will also lose the $15. Okay? So in other words, we framed it in terms of a loss. Here's something you already have. We're going to take it away if you don't win. The other group, they said, well, if you win the auction, we're also going to add on a bonus of $15. Um, so it's framed as a bonus. So here is what the economists, this would be the, um, the, what's the, the equilibrium bid. So this is what you should do. Uh, and just in this particular auction, the way we set it up, you should, bid, you should bid half the value. That's what you should do based on how this auction works. Um, so this is equilibrium. If there's $15 added to it, it goes $15 up, right? You should bid half the value. So this is equilibrium. This is what happens in the control condition. This is overbidding. This is what happens in the bonus condition. This is overbidding. And this is what happens in the loss condition. So what we see is greater overbidding in the loss condition, such that in, in this particular study, a hypothetical auctioneer would have left uh, with about an extra 40 bucks per person. Um, and that's reflected here in the slopes of these lines. Uh, as you can see, in the loss condition, we have a higher slope, not such a difference in the win condition. So the, what this suggests to us is that emphasizing loss increases overbidding led to a higher profit for a hypothetical auctioneer, just the presence of another person relative to a lottery right? Um, in, the, in the initial study. Um, and that fear of loss, social and monetary, in other words, loss aversion, wanting to avoid a social loss in this case, in the behavioral state was actually a monetary loss, right? may in part uh, lead to paying too much in auctions. You, know, you have overbidding without emphasizing the loss. <laughs> just because we think that's always playing a role. But you emphasize the loss, it goes up. Um, so the presence of another may promote so social competition and fear of losing social competition, which can change decisions to pay. Again, I didn't, we haven't linked this yet to arousal, but given what we have already demonstrated, the strong link between arousal uh, and loss aversion, we think those two might be related to each other. Um, I want to now move on to the second part is of this last section. Uh, sorry, I have an extra slide here, um, is how might the effective evaluation of other social group influence choices? So the first one I talked about just having another person there versus not. And now this gets to who that other person is, right? How does your evaluation of that other person based on their social group change the choice that you make? So here, social group, we're defining it by race. 
Um, and uh, one thing we know from a lot of work from social psychologists is that when we think about race attitudes, or attitudes towards social group, we really have sort of two types of attitudes. One we call explicit attitudes. This is what you would tell me your attitudes are about race or race equality. Um, in the United States, over the last 50 years, you know, essentially no one, you know, with rare exception, reports anything but, you know, there's no difference in how I feel about races. Um, that wasn't so common 50 years ago. People actually did say they're explicitly racially, racially biased 50 years ago. Um, these explicit attitudes is what you tell me. They, we, we believe they reflect your beliefs, perhaps also your intentions. Uh, but we contrast these with what we call implicit attitudes, right? These are expressed through our actions without necessarily our conscious effort or control. Um, and one way we measure this is the implicit association test. I'll show you this in a second. Um, but you know, these are thought to reflect, at least at times, your affective associations with that social group, um, which, again, may just be something you learn through growing up in this culture, um, even if it doesn't uh, go along with what your beliefs or intentions are. So the, a typical way to measure these implicit attitudes is the implicit association test. Has everyone done this? You all know what it is? OK, so I'm not going to make you do it. This little demonstration. But for those of you who know, right, you have this uh, speeded reaction time task where you have to press one button, uh, so, so, such as a left button, if it's a word that means something bad or a black face, a right button, if a word that means something good or a white face. You then reverse these contingent contingencies. Uh, and what you find for most white Americans is it takes them longer to, to pair uh, black with good and white with, uh, and white with bad than the opposite. For African Americans, you show that they, as a group, show no effect. Um, but there's actually a lot of variability um, among African Americans. Some look more sort of pro-white on this measure. Some look more pro-black. We did these studies at Yale. Yale undergraduates who are black look pro-white. They look like white students. Inner city New Haven folks uh, are more pro-black on these measures. So it has something to do with your cultural identification you know, in that case. Um, but there's a lot of variability on this measure as well. So in our, initial, our first study looking at this, we, um, in terms of what the representation of the brain is, we had individuals who were white Americans, Yale undergraduates, look at these faces, indicate during scanning, was it repeated or not? After imaging, we gave three assessments of your affective evalu or evaluation of the race group, a direct assessment of race attitudes, explicit measure, the implicit association test I just showed you, and startle eye blink. So startle eye blink is uh, a sort of physiological emotional response. So I go like this, you should startle. I didn't see anybody startle, I didn't loud enough. Um, when you're in the presence of something that you find negative, you're going to startle more. Uh, we measure this by measuring the muscles in your eyes. So I startle you, show you a picture of black face or white face, play a lot of noise in your ears, measure the muscles in your eyes, how much do you blink? And do you blink harder? Uh, and what we found, I don't actually have my behavioral data, I apologize. What we found uh, on both the implicit association test and startle eye blink, our white American participants showed a, a, a pro-white bias, that is they took longer to respond when black was paired with good and white was bad than the opposite, and they showed greater startle when presented with a black face versus a white face. Uh, we also showed, looked at the measures, but there was a lot of variability across subjects. Uh, in this particular study, other people have done other studies, but this was a very early study, a 1.5 Tesla scanner, big voxels. Um, we didn't see a main effect of race, so in the amygdala, we were looking at black versus white face, faces, but we saw a correlation. Those individuals who showed a higher pro-white bias on the implicit association test, showed greater amygdala activation of black versus white. And uh, same thing with startle eye blink. They showed greater startle black versus white. They showed more amygdala activation. Um, so the amygdala activation correlates with this indirect measure of race bias across subjects. Um, and this led to the question, you know, it fits with sort of other things we see in decision making, like trust judgments, right? So, you know, so one thing when we make decisions with, uh, with social others is, is, you know, how much do we trust that individual? Implicit race bias is correlated with amygdala activation to other face faces. Previous research has linked amygdala to ratings of trust in faces as well. So we asked the question, how do we see implicit race bias influencing trust decisions? Um, so the trust game, does everybody know this? 
No? Yes, maybe? Here's your partner. You get a whole bunch of partners. You get black, white, and other race. Um, you have $10. You have a choice. You keep your $10, uh, and your partner gets nothing. Or if you share, whatever you share. You, so if you share 7 you got $3. Your partner has 28 That gets quadrupled. Then your partner has a choice to either share the winnings with you or not. So if your partner keeps, you left with $3. Your trust was betrayed. Your partner has 28 if you share, your partner has 17 and you have 14. All right. So um, again, playing with faces of different races, they were paid for three actual outcomes. We measured IET and a bunch of other measures of race bias. And here's what we found. Here is your implicit race bias. Here is, and this was we measured. Our participants varied by race. We didn't select based on race. We wanted a range of implicit bias. But I'm just going to pull out two individuals here. Here's an individual with a pro-black um, uh, race bias, slightly pro-black. And what you see here is how often they gave amounts from 0 to 10 to individuals who were white versus black. So they are more likely, their trust bias is, is slightly more, more, they're more biased to give more money to black, uh, to black partners. Here's somebody with a high pro-white. IET, and you see the same thing, they're more likely to give more money to white partners than black partners. So a correlation between IET and uh, trust decisions. When we looked in the brain, we saw, replicating our previous results, amygdala bold tracks the race IET bias. Interestingly, striatum tracked the actual decision bias. So again, maybe perhaps consistent with this model, where the amygdala is coding an affective, so perhaps maybe even threat uh, factor, and that gets incorporated into the subjective value of the decision and the action. All right, last study I'll talk about. Um, so these studies, you know, uh, in the trust game, if you're, if you're not trusting somebody who's trustworthy, you're losing money, but you don't really know that in advance. What if you actually know you're just giving away money? What if there's a real personal cost that's immediate and obvious to you? And that's something you get in the ultimatum game, right? So the ultimatum game is something like this. You have, uh, you give, you have splits of $10, right? And we pick the range of 2 to $4. I'm sorry, 0 to $2. That should be 0. Because this is what, you know, are the range of things people call unfair. If you do the ultimatum game, you know, you, you, and you're given uh, $2, you're, just from past research, suggests you're equally likely to accept it or not. So everybody knows how the game works? Anybody not know? OK, so I don't have to explain it to you. Um, so we gave people, uh, we, so they, were, they were shown a partner, um, and they were shown what the partner chose to, to offer. And then they had to make the decision, do you accept this offer or not? And of course, if you reject the offer, you get nothing. So it's ridiculous here to reject anything, but of course, as you know, lots of people do. Um, and the partners, again, were black partners, white partners, or other race partners. And what we found, here's the, and they, the structure, the amount of money offered, and uh, was, was identical for, the, the, for black and white race groups. What we found is you're more likely to accept offers from white than black participants. The point of indifference, where you accept and reject 50%, uh, is higher for black proposals, so consistent with the idea that you're rejecting a higher proportion. And only a small, IIT only accounted for a small amount of the variance in this acceptance rate. It was actually much more of a sort of social group effect. All right, so what I've suggested to you with social decisions is the affective response you have towards others uh, can influence the choices that you make. Um, and you know, the one of the primary things that elicits emotion in us is other people. Um, just having another person there changes how you might respond affectively to a situation and can change the choice. And the social group, the you know, implicit evaluations of race group, can alter decisions to trust or punish. Uh, perhaps irrespective of our intentions, and even when there's a direct personal cost. Um, so just to sum up, I want to, once again, I hope I've convinced you that if we're really going to understand the relationship between emotion and decision making. We have to move beyond these dual system approaches. Um, there's just nothing in, you know, affective neuroscience that suggests we have these two output systems. Um, it isn't consistent with what we know about emotion and other cognitive functions. It assumes that you know, emotion is one thing and decision making is one thing. 
uh, and we know that's not the case. Um, and we can start to do this and think about emotions modulation of value in very specific decisions tasks. And I primarily talked about arousal and sort of a, in, an evaluation of a social group, but there are many other uh, emotion variables to assess, and it will have different effects. So in risky decision makings, I've talked about how arousal is linked to loss aversion. In social decision making, I talked about how social others elicit affective responses due to either their presence or group membership, and that can also alter choices. So I need to thank all the people who did this work, inspired this work, and all of you for your attention. Thank you.